you think you're doing? Slide, slide, slide. I can't find those slides. They would start hiding now. Why don't you try your case? You put them in there ten minutes ago. Look, this is no time for jokes. However, just to show you... <laughs> I'm sorry, Frank. It's a conference, jitters. You sure you got your speech? Of course, idiot. <laughs> it's coming on at the end that worries me. Nervous, huh? What do you think? I thought you did a lot of this sort of thing when you were in America. Yes, but this is the first time in Germany, remember? The weaker sex. By the way, this is as much your stuff as mine, Dr. Overton. Ah, we said all that two weeks ago. Let's not go over it again. Oh, incidentally, uh, Joan's coming tonight. Joan, Joan, Joan. No, don't tell me. Joan, Joan. My wife. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Frank. <laughs> You're forgiven. Come on, the old man's waiting. Oh, I'm ready when you are. Can you imagine the girl says she's nervous? I shouldn't be surprised. Uh -huh. charming German colleague, Dr. Wieland. How do you do, sir? How do you do? I've heard a lot about your exciting work with Overton. That's why I came here to tell you what I think of it. Well, I, uh, I hope you won't be too disappointed, Sir Keith. <laughs> Park this for me, will you, Frank? And I'll catch up with you later. Right. I ran into Blazer the other day. Oh, did you? He was asking after you. Mm -hmm. That is an old fool. He gives me a pain. Oh, forget him. Think of my worries instead. Rats were placed in a cold environment and made to rebreathe their expired air in a closed vessel. So that the proportion of oxygen decreased and that of carbon dioxide increased. Right in front, was like. Naturally, the body temperature fell to minus 70 degrees centigrade. As you might well suppose, the overall effect of this... Join us at the same time next week for Joan Overton's next interesting talk on current fashion. Well, Joan, my love, if you think that's a fashion talk, you should be hung drawn end quarter. Why? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? Telling all those nice kids to buy a good suit that will last years and just bring the changes on the accessories. <laughs> it's positively immoral. Hello. How long have you had this cheap old rag? Hmm. Three days. And how long do you intend to keep it? Well, it depends if my loving husband likes it or not. He hasn't seen it yet. I bet he won't like it. Why not? Grow oh, up, baby. Or do I have to make you a drawing? Oh, that. Oh, well, he's used to that. He won't mind. What makes you think so? I used to. Ah. Do you really think I've overdone it? If it were anybody else, I'd say yes. But as it's you... Come on, I've got my page to look after and it's getting late. Oh, let's have one for the road. You can't have. You can't go to a scientific meeting smelling of drink. Mm, you're joking. 
And it'll be over by the time I get there. With any luck. Then why the finery? Female competition. Ah, now you're moving into my country. And what does that mean? Helen Veland. Helen Veland. Who is she? A beautiful scientist. The plot thickens. Come, come, come. Well, she was called in by the World Health Service. And Frank was asked to help her. And man, does she need help. I don't see Frank these days. What the hell do they do? Believe it or not, they stick chimpanzees into a deep freeze for a few months. And bring them out alive. Both the parent chimpanzees have been deep frozen and kept in the cold store at a temperature of minus 80 degrees centigrade for three months before they were mated. We've been carrying out very exhaustive tests. None of the experimental animals have suffered any damage to the brain or major nerve centers whatsoever. In conclusion, the great problem until now of all low temperature work with large animals has been how to stop the heart and then freeze the blood quick enough to prevent brain damage from oxygen starvation. Happily, Dr. Frank Overton's thermal control panel has solved this difficulty. But now we find ourselves face to face with a very intriguing question. Where next? I'm afraid I shall have to ask Dr. Overton to deal with that part of the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, can you tell me where the low temperature lecture is? Uh, first floor. Thank you. Excuse me, madam. Do you have invitation? Invitation? My husband's Dr. Frank Overton. Is that anything else? That'll be all right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. What's the maximum period of successful cold storage? Well, our maximum is three months. But uh, in theory, that could be extended to three years, 30 years, 300 years, just as long as you like. Uh, it makes no difference. They'd still come back as good as new. It's very simple. For where life is suspended, time actually has no meaning at all. I should like to know if you foresee any possibility of extending your experiments to the human animal. It occurs to me, for instance, that some of our aging politicians might welcome the idea of going into cold storage <laughs> until the next general election. We'd be very happy to oblige the opposition, although I'm afraid they might like a trial or a test run first. Uh, perhaps the questionnaire would uh, like to volunteer to be the first guinea pig. <laughs> I have notice of that question, but seriously, I take it that you are still a long way from human deep freeze. Oh, no, sir. Oh, you <laughs> go ahead, you go ahead. I'll handle the brick bats. Well, the question is, are we still a long way from human deep freeze? The answer is no. We are right on the doorstep. Dr. Overton and I are convinced that we could take a suitable human being, freeze him and revive him with all his faculties intact. All we want is a chance to show we can do it. We haven't any problem with the chimps. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I am sorry, but our time is up, and I'm afraid the fascinating subject of deep freezing the human animal must <laughs> itself go into cold storage for the moment. It only remains for me to thank all our contributors for this very interesting symposium on hypothermia. Well, you haven't noticed it. You haven't noticed? How can I miss it, darling? I'll get you a drink. I'll have a scotch. You mean a sherry? Oh, Frank, Frank, do come and help. My voice is giving out. Very nice to see you again. Goodbye. Sorry to put in comment, but I'd like to have a word with you. Oh dear, I was just going to talk to Mrs. Overton. Oh, unfortunately, I've got to leave in a minute. Oh, very well. 
Darling, no sherry, only champagne. Oh, I hate it. I'm sorry to hang you up like that. It was my fault, Mrs. Overton. I didn't realize Frank was getting a drink. Do call me Joan. It's much friendlier in the circumstances. Oh, yes, I'd like to. I expect you know my name is Helen. Yes, I saw it in the program. I'm sorry I couldn't get here before. I'm sure your speech must have been fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> darling, would you get me another? I think we ought to get something to eat. Oh, you poor darling, you must be starving. Why didn't you say so before? <laughs> You must come and have a meal with us sometime, Helen. What do you mean, sometime? No time like the present. Oh, uh, you're very kind, and I'd love to, but um, the speech-making has worn me out. I can hardly wait to get back home. Thank you very much. Are you sure time. you won't change your mind? Um, no, not tonight. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, dear. That's, that's too bad. I wish you'd join us. You know, I think you haven't got something. Uh, Perhaps we should go home after all. I thought you wanted to show off your new outfit. Darling, I only wanted to please you. Let's go. I hope I've made myself clear. I cannot have the unit associated in any way with Eve Free's experiments on humans. Of course, but it's a point we must reach one day. Not while I'm in charge, I hope. By the way, are you free next Friday morning? I'm not sure why. But they're going to refreeze Susie. Susie? Yes, the mother chimp in that family group that Helen Beelan showed us. Why don't you come along and watch? Well, I'll... I'll see what I can do. So long. What temperature is she now? Minus ten. Oh. She doesn't look frozen to me. Stupid old fool. And don't forget she's absorbed about a gallon of glycerol. That's why she hasn't iced up yet. Martin, did you uh, put a new cylinder in? Yes, sir. Walter on the telephone, long distance. All right, thanks, Martin. You manage, Helen? Yes, of course. Now we are taking her right down to minus 80. Is that carbon dioxide? Yes, we freeze it around her. What's the point? Why not pack her in dry ice straight away? First thought, yes, yes. But uh, on second thoughts, no. Uh, you, you see, uh, Sir Keith, the body surface would cool much quicker than the interior if we did that. Now, this way, all the body processes are arrested simultaneously. Then she'll stay sweet and sound until we wake up. I see. Mm. Are you ready, Martin? Yes, sir. All right, let's go. Oh, yes. Hey, just a minute. How much? How much? Whew. You couldn't have timed it better. Oh, I better take that down. Hold it a minute, Frank. Well, there is your ice, Sir Keith. That's quick. It's just as well, because we are pretty tired at that stage. <laughs> Minus 75 going on automatic. All right, Martin. Let's wrap her up. Minus 80 on automatic stabilizing. Are you through? Yes. Good. That was a most impressive demonstration. Most impressive indeed. But you must come again when they do the resuscitation. Yeah. That's much more exciting yeah. to watch. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I've laid on tea in my office. Uh, will you come, Helen, and you, Frank? No, we were going to get uh, Jackie ready. Oh, but surely you can spare a few minutes. As I was saying, when the heart starts beating again, and you hear the first thud and thud on the amplifier, <laughs> that's really exciting. Ah, as the tea doesn't seem to have turned up. While I read you a message I've just received by telephone, perhaps you'd like to drink a glass of champagne in honor of the winners of the Alexis Carroll Award. Helen Maria Wieland of Munich, Germany. And Francis Henry Overton of Boston, USA for their remarkable advances in the field of low temperature research, which opens up far-reaching possibilities in human surgery. Carol! Oh, 
it's almost on par with the Nobel Prize. Certainly in terms of cash. They'll get $25,000 each. 20. Frank. <laughs> yes, $25,000. And you can spend it all on this if you like. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you have preferred tea? Twelve four five nine six. Frank. Hi, darling. Just wanted to check and see if you were there. I'll be along shortly. I don't believe it. You're not ill, are you? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Sit tight. I'll be there in a few minutes. Great. Bye. What's all that about? Put your skates on. Frank's coming home. What's going on? Half term. Parents day. Archbishop Street. Cut the wise talk and go, man. Just go, huh? Are you trying to get rid of me? Oh no. What do you think? Oh, Joan is really excited. For the first time in her life, she can have anything, do anything she wants. It must be the champagne. I still can't take it in. <laughs> well, here you are. I've just been speaking to Professor Hubbard about another matter, which he thinks you both ought to hear about, by the way. It concerns you in particular, Overton. Well, what is that, Sir Keith? This splendid piece of news has come just at the right moment to set the seal on your work with Dr. Wieland. Uh, worthy Victor's garland, so to speak. So now we must give you new fields to conquer. Professor Bradshaw wants you to take over the remote control sampler for their radiation investigation. Oh, Sir Keith, we, we just barely scratched the surface of this low temperature project. Precisely. The pioneer work's finished. It's time for the big battalions now to step in. You may be right, but you still need us. I've considered the possibility and decided that Dr. Wieland should carry on here. You mean you want to break us up now when we've just reached the final stage of our work? What exactly do the words final stage refer to, Dr. Wieland? The first human experiment, of course. I consider all this talk about a human deep freeze experiment extremely ill-advised and premature. The Alexis Carroll trustees don't seem to share your opinion, Sir Keith. No one hopes more fervently than I for the day when suffering humanity can be treated by your method and be cured. But it would be fatal to encourage false hopes despite the enthusiasm of the current trustees. You don't think for one minute that we've been conducting these experiments for the welfare of a half a dozen monkeys, do you? The high policy of the executive is outside your terms of reference, Dr. Overton. Well, what the hell do you think we've been doing here? Don't want you around when Frank gets back, that's all. Why not? A little competition will do him a world of good. Look. He might stop thinking of you as simply another body for the deep freeze. What are you trying to do? Look in the mirror, my sweet. I'm trying to get a very attractive woman back into circulation. If a chimpanzee dies during an experiment, that's one thing. But a human life is quite different. I'm sorry. But the risk of failure is much too great. Sir Keith. The certainty of destruction by incurable disease is absolute. It is only by experiment and occasional failure we discover the knowledge and techniques that make for success. All we are asking for is to carry out these experiments in a calm and secure atmosphere. That is no part of my responsibility. It most certainly is. And until you give your word, the millions of people throughout the world suffering from incurable diseases will have to face their fate as best they can. You know what my mother used to say? The years raised by but the magic lingers. That's how it is with us, Joan. You are wasting your time. Look, we had our little interlude. And it was over the day I met Frank. You knew that. Well, nothing has changed. It's Frank now and always. In my experience as a crime writer... Oh, clear off! You're reaching the point of no return. And it'll hurt you more than it'll hurt me. I think that young woman is most persuasive. Possibly because her fiancé died of cancer. Ah, that accounts for it. I think if I knew I had only a few weeks to live, I'd volunteer for her. By the way, Hubbard, I think you ought to step in. Huh? You must tell them that human experiments are out. They'll take it better from you. In the meantime, of course, I shall consult various authorities. 
Well, I must be going now. You mean you'll sit on the fence, and if someone makes a fuss later, I shall take the rap? My dear Hubbard, I had no such thought in mind. Well, put your veto in writing for the record, and if you do that, I'll pass it on. Eight or nine thousand pounds. <laughs> in dollars, that's 25,000, any way you look at oh, it. Oh, Frank. Oh, what can we do with it? Whatever you'd like. What would you like? <sighs> Messes of things. We could have another car, mm. you know, a little one for town. Sure. And then we could have a fabulous holiday. And we could have a little period cottage hmm, for the weekends. You know, that's something I've been thinking about. Not the weekends, just a place in the country. You know, long walks and fresh air. I could commute. Give me a chance to catch up on my reading. Yeah. What about my job? Listen, what about your job? There's things about time you were quitting it. Yeah, but... Joan, all the money you make, it either goes in taxes or you, you spend it on clothes. I... I don't know. I, we've been married five years. I'd like to start thinking about... having kids. Kids? Well, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you want a family, don't you? Oh, well, sure, but... Good, that's settled then. Yeah, let's celebrate for that. When do we start? Start what? Why, looking for the house. Oh. <laughs> On weekends, it'll be fun driving around. And when we find what we want, I start raising the family, is that it? Some of the better as far as I'm concerned, that's up to you. Mm -hmm. And when does Helen Veland leave for Munich? Oh, I, I don't know. You don't have to look so upset about it, Frank. <laughs> upset? What is, what is Helen... Villain got to do without, without having a family. Look, if you think I'm going to lose my looks and my figure, retire to this grand house in the country, take long walks and plenty of fresh air while you catch up on your reading, with that woman around, you're crazy. Look, you're not serious. You can't be jealous of Helen. No more than you are of Tony. Look, you can call it uh, intelligent anticipation. You may not be in love with her, but she certainly is in love with you. Let me set you straight about something. Helen and I work together. We work together harmoniously, mm -hmm. but it begins and ends with our work. What do you think we are, a couple of newspaper people? Touché. But you're human, and so is she. And you're out of your mind. Am I? Well, I watched her at that lecture hall. Why don't you knock it off? Just knock it off! Now that you mention it, yes, she is attractive, and she's human also. Where are you going? I'm working tonight. Oh, another experiment, huh? All night. Oh, yes, every night. Oh. Hello. Tony. Was she thrilled? I guess you might say she was. She got a little steamed up. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I got steamed up, too. Well, she got steamed up in a different way. She's, she's annoyed because I can't take her to dinner tonight. Well, why shouldn't you? All you have to do is verify those figures, and then Martin and I can do the rest. You see, at 11.5, the cryogenic modulator was at minus 40, and then 10 minutes late... 10 minutes later... It would be better if you went home. You want me to? Yes. Right on. I'll call her up. I better see what Martin's up to.
the crowd sees me a dancing, carefree and romancing, happy with my someone new. I'm laughing on the outside, crying on the inside, for I'm still in love with you. They see me night and day having such a gay time. They don't know what I go through. I'm laughing having fun. Fun? I've had such fun in years, Tony boy. Just like the old days. So there's something to be said for this monkey business, after all. Monkeys? Oh! <laughs> monkeys. The hell with monkeys for the night. Yes, to us. To us. Wait up. A bottle of Wolf Key Co, please. 1951. Where are I, You were bewitching that night. You ordered a bottle of vintage champagne and you couldn't afford to pay the bill. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky I had my new gold wristwatch. Oh, sure. To the night, it was never to end. me for what you mean is urgent it's a whole night's work I'm damned if I'm going to do it all right you get JB to the phone I'll tell him myself hi to the queen of the jungle hi elephant boy Tanzu lunki shanyam. Mama Tanzu. Huh? Tanzu, madam. Oh, why, sure, elephant oh, boy. Come good. on. But look here, JB. Surely the paper doesn't own me body and soul. It's damned unfair. Ah, all right. But it's the last time. Tony, where have you been? Look, Joan, I've got to go. Oh, but I was just beginning to enjoy myself. I've got to write an article for tomorrow's copy. Put it on the stage, Charlie. Come on. Oh, but it's early. What time is it? What are you doing? Writing your memoirs? You keep quiet, Joan. Be all right if you had some booze. Haven't you had enough? That's a great question. Well, you have drunk me dry of whiskey. Huh. But there's gin somewhere. If you find it, you can uh -huh. start on that. But don't blame me for your head in the morning. Mm, it's empty. Mm. That's empty. Ah. Hey! What's this? Huh? 
Put that thing down. Which thing? The gun. And always remember the old saying. Never, not even in fun, point the gun at anyone. It's a damn stupid thing to do. All right, don't blow your top. What you keep it for, anyway? It's a souvenir I got of a little crook. I whitewashed him in a very dirty story. Harry? Listen, when you finish writing your love letter, could we go to that little jungle place again? Because I like you there. When I turn in this story, puppet, it will be daybreak. Um, don't be a spoiled sport, Tony. You said we, we were having fun. Look, you said it was just, just like the old days, remember? Why don't you go home? And as you have decided to wander about, all right, do that. Go back to your jungle. I'm going to work in peace. Good night. Oh, jump in the lake. Don't worry about it. Even if Sir Keith does put his veto in writing, I shall bring the matter up again at the Scientific Council. Thank you. I've already told Frank. He took it very calmly, considering he's not exactly fond of Sir Keith at the best of times. Joan asked him to take her out tonight. Um, very natural under the circumstances. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, I think they must have had a pretty bad row. In fact, I know they did. Yeah, well, that's their business, isn't it? Oh, yes, of course. It's just I'm sorry it happened, that's all. Helen, has it occurred to you that Frank's wife may feel rather shut out? I don't see why. Ours has just been a happy working relationship. I know. But it's not always easy to keep it that way. Good night. I certainly asked for it, but I'm sorry you had to say it. It was necessary. You see, I've been very careful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh? There you are. I suppose I'm the last person you want to see. Mm -hmm. well, the same goes for me. I've got something to tell you. Most Important. I... Martin, would you tell Dr. Overton his wife is here? Huh. Oh, well, I don't want to see him. Uh -huh. I want to see her. As a matter of fact, you can go to. The world is full of people like you. But you're wasting your time. Because you're not going to get the better of me. Oh, no. You're going to get more than you bargain for. What the heck? Helen, you'd better go. No, no. What's going on here? Come on, Joan, let's go home. No. Come on, let's no. go. No! Let, ah! No! Oh, uh, let me go! I want to see ya! Poor Frank. Ring him up when I've gone. Tell him not to worry about it. Nobody will ever refer to it again. Do you hear, Helen? Yes, sir. I, I'll do that. What a queer sort of day it's been. What do you have to put up with? When you leave me, they'll say, what a bitch. Surprised it lasted that long. That'll suit your book, won't it? Why didn't you say something? What the hell do you want me to say? Why don't you get your clothes off and get into bed? Talk about this thing in the morning. I want to talk now. You're in no condition to talk about anything now. You. I wish I was dead. Oh, that's a bright, drunken speech. Hello. Helen, good of you to call. 
Yes. Yeah, it's all right now. Professor Hubbard asked me to let you know. Oh, that was nice of him, Helen. Thank you. Well, boy, I'm not worried. It's just that... Thank God he didn't see this. Hold on, will you? What are you doing with that? lab tonight? Well, I, I only meant to frighten her. I was mad. I'd, I was all mixed up. It just must have been the scotch. You brought this thing along to frighten Helen? Look, I, I swear to you, I didn't take it out of the bag. She, she didn't see, honestly. Didn't you know the gun was loaded? Don't look at me like that. Answer me, did you no, know? I loaded? didn't! They only said it was empty. It wasn't his fault, Frank. Let me get to him back. Please, Frank, breathe! You've got to believe me. I swear to you, I didn't know it was loaded. Frank, I was so unhappy. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted her to know, that, to see what she was doing to me. Frank, I've tried. For weeks and weeks, I felt you going further and further away from me. I, I didn't want to do. I know she's the kind of woman you ought to have married. But I couldn't get you, let you go. I love you too much. I just felt tonight if I didn't have a showdown, I'd, I'd go out of my mind. Well, it's empty now. Are you ready to start now, Dr. Wieland? Yes, but uh, Dr. Overton said he'd ring, so let's give him a few more minutes. Mm. Uh, by the way, is there any more coffee? What? Again? Yes, again. I'm an addict. You've gone to bed. Yeah, I'm, I'm going in a minute, but I wanted to talk to you. Go ahead. Do you think, do you think we can get away for a little while? You know, just a little holiday. I don't suppose you could fix that, huh? I, I could. I, I, it would mean helping Helen with that experiment tonight. 
can't let her do it alone. I mean, all night, which uh, you're not very fond of. My, my darling. Oh, I love you so much. I hope the experiment will be a great, big, smashing success. It will be. It better be. Four, five, nine, six. Don? Tony. What have you done with my gun? Oh, well, I was going to play a silly joke, and unfortunately it misfired. Misfire? But I was going to bring it back. Come and fetch it. All right. All right, Martin, we start. Helen, thanks for calling me. Frank? I'm glad you didn't go ahead with Jackie. I was just going to. I've got a much better idea. You realize, of course, that once Vernon puts that veto in writing we're sunk, we can't go ahead without getting Hubbard into hot water. We've got to be there first. Yes, but how? Tonight we're going to experiment on me. Don't look so shocked. I don't know why I didn't think of this thing sooner. I'm perfect for the experiment. Right weight, everything. Believe me, it'll go like clockwork. You'll see. Oh, you have the ratio figures for the human experiment. All we have to do is add an extra liter of glycerol. No. It's too much of a risk. What do you mean, too much of a risk? There is no risk. We've been saying there's no risk. I know, I know, but it's different when you're faced with it. I mean, we could be wrong. Will the human heart stand it? And what about brain damage from oxygen starvation? And what about your wife? I'm doing this for, for Joan, too. No, Frank, no, I won't do it. I can't, not with you. I'd be too scared of something going wrong. Unless, of course, that's what you want. You're out of yourself. Helen, do you realize what this means if this experiment is successful? And it's bound to be successful. It, it opens up unlimited possibilities for the world of surgery. And think of future generations, Helen. It'll free them of malignant disease. Look, it's something we've discussed sometimes back and forth. It's something we're agreed upon. It's something you do yourself. Well, isn't it? Answer me. All right. You win. Naturally. Martin. We're going to conduct our first human experiment tonight. You're going to be a part of it. Oh, you don't expect me to. No, 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 no. It's, it's on me. It's on me. Joan, are you going to be long? Coming right away. You had better. You owe me an explanation. What does this mean? Oh, I haven't seen that. Huh. Well, it just went off. Come, don't worry. Have a drink. All right, I need it. And put that gun down. Oh, that's all right. Don't worry. It isn't loaded. I've made sure of that. This is no laughing matter. If there had been an accident, I might have landed in jail. Well, with your uncle, a police vice president? More than ever. I never got it licensed. It should have been handed in to the police. Incidentally, whilst burying our souls, where's Frank? On his last experiment. Oh, back to the apes. Name your poison, Jane. You have no whiskey. Lime juice, please. I'm on the wagon from now on. For how long? Forever. What, ever? Forever and ever. You don't believe me, do you? Well... Here's Alvida Zane to Joan the Soak. Don't move. I'll phone for an ambulance. You'll be all right. Don't worry. Oh. I'm here, John. Why? Why? Frank, say, what's happening? Why? 
It's an automatic. So, when you thought it was empty, the last bullet was in the muscle. I should have checked it. Oh, my. Oh. What do you mean? Frank. Didn't. No. <laughs> oh, you mean Frank doesn't know it was my gun? The heart stops here, and the blood freezes here at minus one, and this is where every second is going to count. We have got to close this gap faster than we've ever done it before. Must have a bigger safety margin. Because of his brain? Yes. This is where there's a risk of damage, if we're unlucky. You better hurry up, Alan. I'm going to fall asleep on you. I'm coming, Frank. Yes, Martin? How shall I enter this, Dr. Wieland? What was our last serial number? X700. Well then, experiment X701. Human. Understand on full current. Good. Six seconds to spare. Will he be all right? He looks all right so far. Looks different from the chins, doesn't he? Sir Keith trying to stop us from doing a human experiment. He said we must get in first. Must, must, must. Is that all? Oh, you know, Frank. As usual, he started on our mission to humanity. He cornered me. What could I say? So Frank offered himself as a guinea pig, and you accepted him. 
because of his wife. What's she got to do with it? Does his wife know? Well, when are you going to bring him back? Tonight. Martin will come at 7 o'clock. Yes. But what's he want? Oh, I see. Oh, and send him in. There's a man from the police. He wants to see Frank. He can't, can he? Any idea what he wants? No. No. Oh, well, then you better go home. I'll talk to him. Oh, no, please let me stay. Why don't you tell me? Afterwards. Come in. Good morning. Sorry to bother you. I'm Detective Inspector Prento, and this is Sergeant Green. Well, I'm Professor Hubbard, and this is Dr. Veland. Morning, madam. I understand you want to see Dr. Overton. If he's here, sir. He is. I thought he might be. He's calm as outside. But he's not available at the moment. I would better make him available. Well, that's not so easy. He's involved in an experiment. <laughs> then you'd better stop for a while. I've got some important questions to ask him. I'm afraid he's unconscious. Perhaps you'd better tell me what you want him for. At this stage? That's not of your business, sir. Then you'd better make it my business, Inspector. We may want to keep Dr. Overton unconscious for weeks, even months. Do I understand yes, that you will hinder the police in the execution of their duty? No, I'm asking you to tell me what you want to talk to Dr. Overton about. Very well. We think Dr. Overton can help us in connection with his wife's sudden and violent death by shooting. <gasps> Perhaps Dr. Wieland would be more helpful. One moment, Inspector. This lady is a member of an international organization. Shouldn't you warn her that she doesn't have to answer your questions at this stage? Yes, yes, of course. But I was about to do that. Well, right, Doctor. I can... I can only say I'm, I'm very shocked to hear the news. He's a dear friend and colleague. Yes, yes, I only want facts. For the early part of the evening, he was here. His wife called. He, they, they left. And later, he returned to do the experiment. Where is he now? I'll answer that, Helen. At the moment, Dr. Overton is in the next room in a glass case surrounded by solidified gas at about minus 40 degrees centigrade. And as you might expect, his life processes are suspended. A man's either alive or dead. Sir. I mean what I say. Suspended. Alive? Alive. I suppose he can be revived. Well, this is an experiment. Mm. Can I see that case? Yes, you can see it. You stay here, sir. Yes, sir. Inside? Yes. And alive? I hope so. I can't raise the dead. It would be very awkward if he passed on. What you have told me is contrary to human experience. I hope that is the truth. For your sakes. Well, scientists are as interested in the truth as the police inspector. Have even of you any reason to suppose that Dr. Overton undertook this experiment in the hope of escaping from the consequences of his actions? Dr. Overton is a brilliant medical scientist. If he wanted to escape anything permanently, all he would have to do is inject himself with some drug, go to sleep peacefully, and not wake up again. That should answer your point, Inspector.
I want Dr. Overton revived as soon as possible. Uh, think about it, Inspector. Dr. Veland has been working intensely for over 24 hours, and there are many other considerations which don't concern you. I'll let you have my decision later in the day. You are probably very wise, Professor. The human mind plays funny tricks when suffering from lack of sleep. Sergeant, I want you to stay in the laboratory until I send you relief. Sir. What are our chances? I can only use the technique we developed. And pray. So your secretary did manage to get hold of you. Yes, he did indeed. I've been traveling the whole day. I thought you wouldn't want to miss the fun. I'm certainly relieved to see that the whole place isn't swarming with reporters. No, because we've persuaded the police to let us finish the resuscitation in peace. In peace? How about don't you realize the full implications of this business? We don't know the facts yet. The facts are obvious. Overton shot his wife, returned to the laboratory, and with Fräulein Wieland's willing connivance embarked upon this experiment, either as a red herring or a wild act of penance. The police haven't ruled out suicide. Or merely because the wound could have been self-inflicted. But how could a dying woman dispose of a weapon? And why on earth should she? So the gun wasn't found. If the experiment fails, as I've no doubt it will, and Overton escapes justice, the whole affair will become a public scandal. We shall all be involved. Well, and Wieland will no doubt be charged with being an accessory after the fact. Your control of your staff will be severely criticized. Not to say anything about my own authority. Oh, I'm sure you'll come out all right. I intend to, in the interests of the organization. Well, are you going to stay and watch? Naturally. Do you know Karl Merkheimer, the pathologist? He's here. Karl Merkheimer? Here? The police wanted an independent medical observer. Why? To make sure that Helen does everything she can to bring Frank back alive, I imagine. Karl Merkheimer, of all people. Oh, he's quite a nice chap. I don't care what he's like. Every Tom, Dick and Harry in this country knows his name and connects it with sensational criminal trials. This is getting worse and worse. Things should start happening pretty fast now. How soon can you tell if his brain is undamaged? He'll be able to talk for a minute or two, and then he'll slip back into a sort of coma. A coma? And how do you deal with that? By stimulating the heart. Uh, we bit trigger that. Yeah. Judging how much you give him is a difficulty, I would imagine. Yes, I have to be careful not to overstimulate, or he might die of shock. Would you say then that the final stage is the most critical? In uh, this case, yes. This is Dr. Merkheimer. Sir Keith Vernon. Oh, how do you do? What are these for? Emergency use. If he looks like passing out, no, in case one of your lot comes over, queer. Martin, are you ready? Coming, Doctor. I will soon be opening up the coffin. Stick by the door and keep it quiet. Can't I watch, sir? That keen, aren't you? Only scientifically minded, sir. Sorry. You have a full hour already. On the door, Green. Minus one standard pressure. Minus one standard pressure. Thermomodulator cut 50. Thermomodulator cut 50. Zero. Zero. Switch on heart amplifier. Switch on heart amplifier.
Give me the police vice president, please. 18? 18. 19? 19. Cut dial thermal generator. Cut dial thermal generator. Now. Skintetra has returned already. We can help him on with some artificial respiration. The amplifier? Yes. We'll start 600 cc and give him a pulse rate when you get one. Pulse rate 40, rising. 48. 52, heart fibrillation becoming even. He's on the verge of consciousness now. We should know in a few moments whether, whether he's normal. When I put him under, I asked him to stop counting at 12. If his brain is undamaged, it should pick up his last memory pattern and he'll go on counting where he left off. Rate 58, blood pressure 90 to 70, falling. Electros. Electro. Gloves. Electros. We'll start at 2.50, time check every 30 seconds. Start at 2.50, time check every 30 seconds. Not out of the woods yet, is he? No. Not yet. Four minutes at 4.30, pulse 62. Step up complex C to 500. Step up complex C to 500. It's an open and shut case of murder. Yes, sir. I took down as fast as evidence. We are going to need it. Four minutes at 500, pulse 64. Cut off. 
Repeat instructions. Cut off. The amplifier. No, the heat. And the heat? Is he here now? Yes, I'm not prepared to risk any more injection. rate 56 stop that phone ring gone wrong. Why don't you inject him to the heart? Sir Keith. The police vice president wants you, Inspector. Dr. Oldton's wife shot herself accidentally. A witness has come forward. I'm going to jump the charge up now. Contacts, coaching. Contacts, coaching. One year ago, those of us who knew Dr. Overton well never doubted for a moment that his motives in volunteering for this remarkable experiment were purely scientific. I, perhaps more than anyone else, am delighted and relieved that it was successful because of the heavy load of responsibility that falls on any commander who encourages his crack troops to venture into no man's land. But it was a responsibility I was glad to take. <laughs> that old fakie did say that a year ago. And good luck to him. Life would be a lot duller without the Sir Keiths of this world. 